Troubles and troubles and times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humbling your hearts, dear God, safe from the chastening rod. Seek the way, pilgrims trod, Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon.
start off by saying thank you, Pastor, for allowing us to be here tonight. And then also thank you, each and every one of you that had a part in the meal tonight. It was wonderful. Uh, we certainly enjoyed it and it was a blessing to us. But I'm not going to say uh, any more as to not be uh, redundant. So we're going to go ahead and play the video if, if you're ready up there. Hello, my name is Wesley and my wife's name is Kayla. And we are the Grant family. We are missionaries that are being sent out of Morning Star Independent Baptist Church of Easley, South Carolina, and we are being assisted by Worldwide New Testament Baptist Missions, which is located in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. And we are going to Northwest Montana. Montana is located in the Northwest region of the United States. There is a county there, which is where we plan on trying to plant the church, and it is located in a valley, which is called Flathead Valley. And in recent years, the population in this county has soared to 100,000 people. Of this total population, only 33% of them consider themselves to be religious at all. 5.5% are Catholic. 6% are Lutheran. 4.5% are Church of Jesus Christ, which is Mormon. And 8.9% of them are other Christian faiths, which does include non-denominational. And only 1.9% of the total population consider themselves to be Baptist. In addition to Flathead County, there is also the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, which is located in the northernmost region of the state. The population of this reservation is 10,400 people, and a good number of them live in poverty. In 2016, this number was calculated to be 44.5% of the total population that live here having an income level of below poverty. And in many cases, this leads to people living in situations that would be considered by most as being deplorable. Situations like this can breed a feeling of total helplessness. But even with this being said, these are proud people. They are proud of their heritage as Native American Indians and annually they throw a big Indian Day celebration which takes place in the town of Browning. In addition to working with the Blackfeet Nation, we will also seek to go into the Flathead Indian Reservation to teach them about salvation also. This reservation sits just south of Flathead County. The population was nearly 30,000 people as of the year 2010, and the majority of this population consider themselves to be Roman Catholic. The poverty level here, however, is not nearly as bad as it is in the Blackfeet Nation, but it still affects nearly a quarter of the population. The primary issue here, however, is Roman Catholicism. Just about a three and a half hour drive southeast of the Flathead Reservation, you can find a statue of the Virgin Mary standing 90 foot tall. The statue is named Our Lady of the Rockies and is the fourth largest statue in America. Montana is also known for having the highest suicide rate of any state in America. The national average is 13.5 suicides annually per 100,000 in population, whereas Montana has 25.9. It is clear to see that Montana needs hope. The only hope that there is, is the hope of the Bible. Will you help us to reach Northwest Montana for the glory of God? Thirty three percent of the population that claim to be religious at all. And this, as you saw, was primarily other Christ or other um, denominations rather uh, than Baptist. And just because it says one point nine percent of them are Baptist there in that county does not mean that it's uh, uh, all one point nine percent of them are actually going to church and actually practicing what they, they say that they are. It doesn't mean that one point nine percent of them are saved at all. There's many churches there that fly under Baptist uh, name that are not um, actually independent Baptists. They're not uh, KJV only. They're not preaching the word rightly divided. And that is leading people in a, astray and leading them down a wrong path. Um, for instance, there's one church there that I've heard several accounts from different people about 
that they don't even use the Bible anymore whatsoever. They fly under a, a Baptist name, but they have set the Bible completely to the side. And what they do is uh, they, they say that they do spiritual dancing. And from that, they say they get revelations from God, and that's what they teach and preach. And we know that is exactly against what the Bible says. So we need to get, uh, get more churches there, plant more churches in that community so that more people there can have a, a possibility, possibility to come to Christ in a manner of being saved and, and know him as their Savior and know where they're going for eternity. And in addition to that community, uh, each and every Indian reservation has their own uh, government set up. Uh, you can't just go wholeheartedly into a reservation and expect to be able to plant a church right off or expect to be able to do a work right off. You've got to go through the, the reservation governments. And they are able to make any decision that they want as far as uh, missions work or any kind of uh, religious work that goes into them. So we will be working from that location there in Flathead County. We will be working out into the, uh, the two Indian reservations, the, the, the Flathead uh, and the Blackfeet reservations looking to create relationships to get the doors open so that we can go there and, Lord willing, eventually plant a church or just do any, re uh, any um, ministry that the Lord opens the door for us to do there. It's going to be a long route to get there, a long journey to get there, and the people there are very, um, they're very independent people. Uh, you saw there the Flathead uh, Indian Reservation and the Blackfeet Reservation especially uh, have high levels of poverty. And that has led to a bunch of drug abuse, uh, alcoholism, and just a bunch of um, just a, a bunch of depression there. And with that depression uh, comes people that just they want to go and do commit suicide, and that's why you get such a high poverty or a high uh, suicide rate because of the poverty rate being so high in many cases. So just pray for us as we uh, seek to to reach there uh, in Montana and get the the hope of the gospel and get uh, the gospel out there to where people can be saved and. They may not have a whole lot of hope, may not have a whole lot in this life. However, they can have a mansion on the other side, and they can go to heaven to be with Jesus. Thank you for your time. Would you open your Bibles to the book of Philippians in chapter number one? What a wonderful song, amen? And uh, truly it is, what a truth, that when we found the Lord, nothing else really matters, does it? And uh, what a wonderful thing. Uh, thank you so much, Preacher Moore and your family. 
I've enjoyed that very much. You know, I believe I sound exactly the same just like them when I sing. At least in, in the shower anyway, until my wife hits the door and she's like, can you quiet it down in there? But otherwise, buddy, I'd be making CDs right and left. I mean, I'm good. I just want to tell you right now, just my wife won't let me sing in public. But, you know, I am really good. Uh, I really am. But anyway, thank you for allowing me to be here. I've had a wonderful time. I'm looking forward to this. And I pray that throughout this week that God speaks to all of our hearts, not just yours, but mine and each and every one of us. And may you and I be wise as Christians to be sensitive to whatever the Lord wants. May we say, Father, you point at it, you pinpoint it, God, I'll answer and I'll say, here am I, whatever you want, right? The book of Philippians in chapter number one tonight, in just a moment we're going to read just a couple of verses here. The book of Philippians is a wonderful book. In fact, if you go through this, it's a beautiful book. In fact, when you go through the New Testament side, you hit, first of all, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? You hit the Gospels, and then you hit the book of Acts, that transitional book, that bridge that goes across, and to all the epistles, all these letters that were written to the churches. Now, some of them were written by Peter and some by Paul, you know this, but when we go through the epistles, these letters written to the churches, some of them specifically were to the churches, some of them to, were to pastors, and there were general ones. Well, some of them were written from the jail cell. Now... I don't know how you would think, but if I was the Apostle Paul and I was in jail, now he wasn't in jail for doing something silly, maybe like speeding too many times on I-75, just saying, throwing it out there if anybody does that, not looking at myself. But anyway, some people, you might be in jail for the wrong thing, but the Apostle Paul, he was in jail for preaching the gospel. You know, I mean, he was doing what God wanted him to do, and he was getting into trouble. And so, all of a sudden, he's in there. Now, I don't know about you, but if I wrote a letter from jail, buddy, I'd wax eloquently. In other words, I would tell him, oh, this is so horrible, and man, I'm suffering for Jesus, and boy, they're not treating me right. And inside jail, I mean, think about how bad it could be. There is no Chick-fil-A, beloved, in jail. I mean, that right there, that's enough, isn't it? I mean, it's just, everything seems to be bad. But he uses this book to encourage people to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with whatever is going on. So as he goes through this book, he goes throughout, in chapter number one, he talks about different subjects. And in verse number six, my favorite verse, he says, Be confident in the very thing that he, that's God, which has begun a good work in you, he'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful truth, right? In chapter number two, in verse number 13, he says, It's God with work within you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, if God puts in your heart to do something, God's big enough to help you do it, right? Sometimes you say, God, you put in my heart this week to give so much or to help or to be a missionary or to go or to witness to my friends. God, I'm just timid. I don't want to do it. And God says, I'm the one who put it in there and I'll help you make it come out to fruition. God's big enough. He's the one who calls. He's the one who sets aside. God can help you out. In chapter number three, remember? All these wonderful verses where he says, that I may know him. Chapter number four, verse number four, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So he uses this, chapter number four, verse number 13, in that he tells us that we can do all things through Christ with strength and us. What a wonderful book. He uses this book from jail to encourage people. But I want to focus in on chapter number one for a few moments tonight. And in chapter number one, we're going to begin in verse number 19. We're going to all go all the way down. And I want to show you that he specifically kind of pinpoints something here. And he wants to talk to you and to me about the reason, listen, the reason that God has left you here upon this planet. Have you ever thought about why am I really here? You know, to be quite honest, you might have a ticket going to heaven per se. You might have asked Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and praise the Lord for that. If you've never asked him to save you, tonight should be the night. Boy, it's the most important decision, the biggest decision in all the world. Make sure you know you're going to heaven. Don't play around with that. That's a big decision. But you know, after you know that you're going to heaven, many times people just kind of, I don't know, just slide all through, or they just say, I'm just hanging on, or I'm holding the fort, or whatever they may. Listen, you should use your life for Jesus Christ, dear friend, every moment that he gives you. But have you ever really thought why you're here? Not just here in church, but have you ever thought about why God has left you here upon earth? Is it just to have a family? Is it just to make some money? Is it just to be famous? Is it just to have friends? Or what is the real reason that God has for your life? What is the reason that God has left you here? Well, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God, he begins to tell us. So take this little journey with me, if you would. Philippians chapter 1, we'll begin in verse number 19. The Bible says this, Philippians 1, verse number 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation, or his liberation in this sense. He said, I'm going to be saved from this. I'm going to get out of here. He says, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. Look what it says here. And the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. 
Isn't that interesting? Paul says, I'm going to get out of jail. I'm going to be saved from this bad spot that I'm in. But you know how? He says two different things. First of all, because of your prayer. And then second of all, because of the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In other words, God always takes care of his children, doesn't he? Boy, all of us can look back in our life. We might be nervous about the future. But all of us can look back in life and say, God is always taking care of me. I've never suffered. I've never, I've been nervous. And I didn't know how to do it or how to pay or what to do when sickness came or whatever. But God's always taking care of you. He's always taking care of me. He says, I know God will take care of me and the, spirit, the, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I'm going to get out of here. But he also says, because of your prayer. Isn't it interesting that God uses you and me in, in his work? Do you know God can do all the work all by himself? He can take care of missions. He can scream down from heaven or ride it in the sky if he wanted. He can do absolutely anything. God can take care. He doesn't need you to be in missions or to be in church or, or to be in the... But listen, God could do it all by himself, but God chose not to do it by himself. He chooses to use you and me, human instruments, here upon this earth. And so Paul says, I'm going to get on out of here, one, because God's good, and two, because y'all are praying for me. Can I tell you, dear friends, let's pray for our missionaries, amen? Can I tell you, dear friends, let's pray for our pastor, amen? And maybe a little bit louder on that. Let's pray for our pastor, amen? I mean, listen, God, boy, the devil just kicking back and forth. We need to pray one for another, shouldn't we? We should be saying, God, please help us. Let's pray. But look what the Bible says in verse number 20. The Bible says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Look at this next part. But that with all boldness, as always, Christ shall be, would you say that next word, shall be what? Magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. He says, no matter what it is, dear friends, follow with me, no matter what it is, whether I'm in jail, whether I get out of jail, whether I die here in jail, or I continue living, no matter what happens, I do know one thing very, very well. Christ shall be magnified in my body. Let me ask you, do you realize that the purpose that God has left you here, number one, is to magnify Jesus Christ? That word magnify just simply means to make a lot bigger. In other words, your life, your testimony all about you is to make Jesus look a lot bigger and a lot better. You know, I have siblings that, I, there's four of us, three of my siblings, you know, they don't ever go to church. You know why? And maybe you've heard this yourself. They don't go to church because they say church is full of a bunch of, oh, you've heard it too, huh? It must be something around here just like it is up there. But you know, oh man, they say, I want nothing to it. And they have good reasonings per se. But listen to this. When you and I don't live like Christians should live, you know, he's the one who takes all the rap for it. And it's not fair. So you and I, everything we should do, everything about us, let it all, Paul says, whether I live or whether I die, whether I'm in here or whether I'm out there, all of it, may my life magnify Jesus. Now follow with me. Why are you here upon this planet? Number one, we are here to magnify Jesus Christ. Would you say it with me? Why are we here? Number one, to what? Magnify. One more time. Why are we here? Number one, to what? Magnify Jesus Christ. Let's make him look bigger. Let's make him look greater. The Apostle Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 31, whether we eat or we drink, it's almost like he's going to go make a list. I, I enjoy making lists of getting things done, to-do lists or whatever it may be. And Apostle Paul, he's going to make a list. He says, now let me think about it. If you're going to eat something, you're going to drink something more. And he says, well, fooey on that. Just if you're going to eat, you're going to drink or whatsoever you're going to do, absolutely anything else. He says, let it all be for the glory of God. In other words, everything you should do should all be magnifying and making our God look big and great. You know, as Christians, many times we have our way, and sometimes we have, a, you'll ask somebody, and, well, tell me about your life. And let's say, well, you know, I mean, it's one thing at church, it's another thing at home, it's another thing at work. Well, listen, dear friend, as a child of God, all of our life, there shouldn't be a spiritual section and a carnal or whatever you want to call it. All of it should be for the Lord Jesus Christ, shouldn't it? When I was in Argentina, it was funny because people would come up to church, and I mean, we're dealing with first-generation Christians. People get saved, and boy, God would get a hold of their heart, and they'd head on to church, and they'd get out right there. And I remember many times, it was kind of a little bit humorous. They'd Family would pull up, and they'd get their car there, and they'd pull out of the car, and man, they would look sharp, and they'd walk in church, and on their way to church, buddy, they're fussing one at another, and they're bickering back and forth, mom and dad and kids, and everybody going back and forth. All of a sudden, they get into church, and it's just almost like when they open the doors to their car, it's just like this spiritual air comes in. 
They walk out and they put on a smile. How you doing, brother? Good to see you. Boy, God bless you. Everything. Boy, they, I mean, they just, they put on the spiritual air. You know what I'm saying? Then they walk in church and they stand up and they'll begin to sing, holy. <coughs> Excuse me. Just not as good as Brother Moore, but yeah. Holy, holy, holy. Boy, they sing and boy, they look so wonderful and smiling and great. Family looks all in order and everything's good. All of a sudden, they finish the service. They'll go back out there, jump in their car, and it's almost like he closes his door, kids close their door, mom's getting ready to close their door, and it's almost like the last bit of spiritual air is about to leave the vehicle. And all of a sudden, they'll close that door, and whoo, the air goes out and close the door, and all of a sudden, dad turns around and he says, would you kids shut up? Woman, what are we going to have for lunch? Boy, everybody be quiet. Boy, they start going back and forth. And man, they get out and I'm thinking, good night, 30 seconds ago, everybody was just wonderful for Jesus. And now everybody's fighting like cats and dogs. You know what I'm saying? Listen to this. Apostle Paul says, you know why you're here? You are here, number one, to magnify Jesus Christ. At work, you should be a child of God. At home, you should be a child of God. At church, you should be a child of God. Everything about you should almost point up. The Bible says that we are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. You remember that? And then in verse number 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When you live like a child of God should, when you magnify Jesus Christ, everybody looks, boy, it just makes him look bigger. It makes him look greater. Now leave your, your, your finger right there in Philippians. Let's go over to the book of 2 Timothy in chapter number 2. Could we make our way there? We're going to come right back to the book of Philippians, so don't lose your place there. We're going to go over to 2 Timothy in chapter number 2. Once again, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of God, he's the one who's writing here. And God uses him, but he's changing his audience instead of just writing to the church. Now he's writing to a young man. A guy that he is training in the ministry. He's preparing for the ministry. He's bringing along that he is helping, he's maturing and the things of God, look what he says here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou, now, now think about this, and the things that thou, that's Timothy, right? The things that thou, Timothy, hast heard of me, that's Paul, among many witnesses, that's a whole congregation there, the same commit thou, Timothy, to faithful men, look what it says, who shall be able to teach others also. Now follow with me very quickly. Now what is it saying here? Now think about it. The apostle Paul saved on the road to Damascus, right? Acts chapter number 9. All of a sudden he was saved and boy, God began to teach him these wonderful things and some of the things that he might have learned from Peter and James and John, the other apostles, God has taught him and all of a sudden here comes the apostle Paul and he says, hey Timmy, hey buddy, all these things that God has taught me, all these things I've received, I've given them to you in front of all this congregation. So God's given them to me, I've given them to you in front of all the people. Now, I want you to give this to somebody, but not just anybody. I want you to give this to faithful men. These faithful men are not going to throw it under the table. They're not going to put it in the pocket. These faithful men are also going to pass it to others also. Now, follow with me. What's happening here? All the way from Paul to Timothy to faithful men to other people, and it just goes on and on. We see all these generation after generation, we see multiplication. So why, he says, this is what it is. Why are we here? Well, first of all, we are here to magnify. Would you say with me? What are we here for? To what? Magnify Jesus Christ. That's our testimony. That's our life. That's all about us. That's at home. That's at work. That's wherever we're at. We're to magnify Jesus Christ. But not only are we here to magnify, number two, we are here to multiply. Would you say that with me? To what? Multiply. In other words, pass it on from one generation to another generation to keep it going. Can I tell you, dear friends, I tell our missionaries, you know we are one generation. Follow with me. We're one generation away from losing the gospel. We don't give it to our kids. They can't give it to their kids. And you know, many times, and, and please excuse me, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I don't know you well enough, dear friends. And if I point one finger at you, I got three or four looking back at this ugly mug. But let me tell you this. Do you know what? Many times we love to complain about the political situation. We love to complain about the moral situation, the criminal situation, all the financial and everything. Else. And boy, we love to point all the fingers. But listen to this. Do you know what? If we have not shared the gospel with somebody lately, we have no right to complain about anything. Are you following with me? In other words, just because he jumps from one party to another in a political situation, that's not going to make our world different. Just because they have a better education, that won't change our world. Just because they have a little bit more money or whatever it may be, that won't change our world. You know, the only thing that will change the world is the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I have a responsibility. Do you know everything reproduces after its own kind? 
you know, obviously a cow reproduces a cow, right? I mean, this is not too difficult, so follow with me. And a horse reproduces a what? Horse. Right, we know this. And a fish, a fish, and a monkey, my in-laws. No, I'm just kidding. And I mean, everything after its own kind. You're not going to tell them that, right? But you know, everything after its own kind, we know this. And did you know a child of God should reproduce himself spiritually? We're to share the gospel with somebody else so they can know our Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit does the work, but as we share the gospel, the key can be opened, and that person can accept or reject Jesus Christ as their Savior, and we can multiply ourselves over and over and over, and it changes our world. And as you make your way back to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, let me tell you about a couple that's in Argentina that when my wife and I were there, we served as missionaries for many years down in Argentina. We had a wonderful time. God was very good to us and gracious. And while we were down there, my wife and another, she's now a pastor's wife, but at the time she was one of the ladies in the church. And they used to go pick up people for, for, for church, specifically little kids. They'd pick them up and they'd bring them to church. Well, according to this man's testimony, his name is Hernan, and Hernan, according to his testimony, he said, every time those ladies would come, I would think, here's those crazy religious nuts. And he said, I always like to drink, and I like my lifestyle, so I thought, when they come to pick up my kids, I'll push my kids out there, but buddy, I ain't going out to see them. I don't want some nutty ladies talking to me. And so he'd push them out there, and he said he'd go and hide, and he would drink, and he'd live his lifestyle. Well, one day, they were having all kinds of problems in their marriage. Hernan and Rosa were having all kinds of struggles, and she'd already tried to commit suicide once, and... She decided that night, I'm going to really, I'm going to end it all. She got a hold of a sheer gl uh, of glass, and she said, well, that night, I, I was going to do it, but I just didn't have the guts to do it. So I, what I did is I got a hold of a piece of glass. This is her testimony. I got a hold of that piece of glass, and I went to lay down, and I thought, first thing in the morning, I'm just going to slit my wrist. I'm going to end it all. I'll show him. Well, she went to bed that night, and when she woke up that next morning, she said she dropped that piece of glass in the middle of the night somehow. She said she looked under the bed and all around for it, and she never found the piece of glass. Isn't that wonderful how God works? She never did find that piece of glass, so she woke up. She looked at her husband, and he said, you know what, we can't do this anymore. Let's go down there, and let's go to that church where our kids go, and let's see if we can't get some help. He grabbed the hold of his wife's hand, and Hernan and Rosa went down to that church. They sat there, they both heard the gospel, and both of them ended up accepting Jesus Christ. Boy, God changed their life, and things began to happen, and before too long, they were bringing all kinds of people to church. According to that, I mean, they're just bringing people and bringing people. So one day, my wife goes up and she says, uh, Rosa, can I ask you a question? She said, sure. Now, you got to remember, brand new Christian. My wife said, how are you bringing so many people to church? I mean, they weren't bringing two, three, four people to church. Every service, they were just filling up our whole van and a whole bus, and they were just bloating people and bringing them to church. And I, my wife said, how are you bringing so, I mean, if we could figure this out, we'll share the, you know, whatever secret plan you got, and we'll tell everybody, and this is just great. They kept bringing people and bringing people and bringing people. He was already growing. He, I mean, he just, they got baptized. They become members, and they were going through discipleship. He jumped in Bible college. Boy, he was just growing by leaps and bounds. So my wife said, how are you guys bringing so many people to church? We want to know. And this is what she told. You've got to remember, she's a brand new Christian. So my wife said, well, Miss Mindy, what I do is I walk out, and on Saturdays, I'll walk out, and in Argentina, you'll knock on doors, you stand back, and you'll clap. And when you clap, somebody comes to the door, and they'll say, si, sí, como estas? And you'll begin to talk to them. So she'd say, I'd go out there, and I'd clap, and then come to the door. And I would look at the people, and I would tell them, tomorrow is my birthday, and I want to invite you to my birthday party. And she said, I would tell all of them, if you'll meet me, just come to the end of the road. And if you'll stand by the, by the door right here, there's going to be a blue bus that's going to come tomorrow morning. It'll be here around 8.30 in the morning. It's going to pick you up, and I'll take you to my birthday party. For, you can have free cake and everything else. My wife starts figuring out, oh, my goodness. I see what you're doing. So my wife says, uh, Rosa, you, you, you realize you're lying to the people. And this is what she said. Oh, yeah, but by that time, they're on their way to church. They're going to hear the gospel. It's okay. Mike, you got to be kidding me. I said, no, it's not okay, but, I mean, you're bringing people to church. God bless your lying. Keep it up, you know? <laughs> like, what in the world? You know, I mean, you can't do that. But listen to this. Here's what, she, here's what her thought was. God saved my marriage. He gave me a home in heaven. Buddy, this is too good to be true. i got to share it with other people. Do you know when we started the Third Baptist Church in our city, Hernan was the pastor. He took about 40 to 60 people from our first church to go start the second church. And do you know when he did, the majority of those people that he took, almost all of them, he had personally brought and led to the Lord. What a way to start a church, amen? 
And you know, now God is blessing. I just saw a picture of him the other day. And I mean, that guy, he's got, he is super calm. And he's got probably 25, 30 young men that are standing next to him that he is teaching in Bible Institute and preparing them to be pastors. Buddy, he's knocking it out of the ballpark. You know why? He has learned to multiply himself. Do you know, dear friend, God has a purpose. We make our way back to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Why are you here? Is it just because you're, it's an accident, it's fate, it's a coincidence? Why are you here? Well, God has a specific reason that you're here. Do you know what mission is all about? It's multiplying ourselves. The Lord said, here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other parts of the earth, how can I do it? I'll never go over, the, over there. And the Lord said, yeah, but you can pray and help get guys over there. Either go or send a substitute, but let's all have a part in what God wants to do. Amen? You know what, it's our job to, 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 to multiply right here. Can I tell you, dear friend, not just because we throw a couple dollars in the offering plate does it change our responsibility. The church that does not evangelize will soon fossilize. It's our responsibility. There's people all over Stockbridge that need Jesus Christ, all over Jonesboro, all over this area. They need Jesus Christ. Let's bring them to church. Let's invite them. Let's pass out tracts. Let's pray for them. Let's do the work of God. Let's multiply ourselves. As we make our way back to the book of Philippians chapter 1, we'll continue where we left off in verse number 21. The Bible says, for me to live, it's Christ. To die is gain, verse number 22. But if I live in the flesh, it is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I should choose, I will not, verse number 23. For I am in a straight or tight spot betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Look what it says, which is far better. You remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 8. He says to be absent with, from the body is to be present. With the Lord. In other words, your last moment, your last breath here is your first breath up there, right? You close your eyes here and you wake it. I mean, your eyes open right there in a split second. You're there and the Lord said, Paul says, man, I'd love to get on out of here. No more struggles, no more problems, no more health issues, no more financial things. I mean, just get on out of here. I would love to. I'm kind of in a tight spot of what to choose. Look what he says here in verse number 24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh, it's more needful for what does the Bible say? For what? For you. Now, who is that pronoun you? We're going to see it over and over. In fact, in verse number 25, having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you for your further joy. In fact, verse number 26, same thing. Over and over, you and you and you. So what is he saying? As Apostle Paul said, I need to stay here because of you. What is Apostle Paul all conceited? He's arrogant. He thinks he's something. You can't live without me. That's not what he's saying. Apostle Paul saying, you know why I'm here? Yeah, I'm here to magnify Jesus Christ. You know why I'm here? Yeah, I'm here to multiply myself. You know why I'm here? I am here to minister to others. That word minister is a fancy word for serve. You know why God saved you, dear friend? Look right here. You know why God saved you? He saved you to serve him with your life. If you're a child of God, your life doesn't belong to you. Your money, your family, your friends, your time, your talent, and none of it belongs to you. The Lord says, I've given it to you. I want you to volunteer back and say, Father, here am I. Send me, God, whatever you want. You know, so many times I go into colleges and Christian schools. Do you know, and please excuse me, dear friend, but do you know many times one of the greatest hindrances to young people giving their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ are their parents. And I would never, please, please understand, I never want to be disrespectful. I understand I've got five of my own. God has blessed me. I love my kids. And now my oldest daughter, she's 17, she'll be turning 18 here pretty soon. There's a young man, he's just finished, and he's now on his internship. He's getting ready to come back, and he's already asked me, can I ask her to marry me? I thought, I'm going to kill you. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, I'm like, what in the world is he thinking? I'm like, boom. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I've got a lot of land, and I know how to, no, anyway. But, you know, I mean, this, man, and I look and I say, oh boy, and I'm helping the young man right now that he can come back and he'll get back and he'll sit in December and he'll start deputation. They want to get married and here coming up in, in June-ish and, and that time and I'm thinking, Lord, my little girl, and boy, here we go. Boy, I'm a dad. I love my kids. Boy, I want them to be and I would love for them to live right next door to me. I'd love them to get a good job and to know that they're comfortable and see my grandchildren all the time. But what if God wants to take her around the world? You know, many times we're the ones hindering. I believe with all my heart that the reason I'm in ministry today, my grandma, she used to pray for me all the time. God, would you help that little boy? That rascal, get him saved, God. Make him a preacher. You know, I didn't come from, my, my family, we came from the projects, and there was all kinds of drugs and different things where, where we grew up in the projects, and my grandma, she would pray and pray. My, my grandpa, he was a, Paul was a drunk, and I mean, we didn't live the, the good old life per se, but you know what? 
I mean, she just prayed and prayed and prayed. She got out of there and kept praying and praying and praying. And all of a sudden, God got a hold of my heart. Listen, grandmas and grandpas, you can pray that God will use your grandchildren. Parents, you can pray that God will use your children. Young men and young ladies, give your lives and say, Father, if you want to take me around the world, around the street, whatever it is, here's my life. Why? What are you here for? We are here to minister, to serve Jesus with our lives. You see, you and I, we only have one life to live. Soon it will be past, and only what's done for Christ will last. Why don't you say, God, here I am. You know this thing about missions, it's not something that Pastor Grimes has said, you know what, we don't have anything to do in September. Let's throw her on in there in the calendar. We'll make some room for her. That's not why there's a, that there's a missions conference. You know why there is? Because God wants to use you and me to serve him and get the gospel all around the world. How many of you believe, let me ask you, how many believe the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back soon? I certainly do. I mean, look at our situations around us. Seems like everything's kind of pointing over there. He said the other day, you know, I went to fill up on gas. I was in South Carolina last night. I went to fill up on gas yesterday, and as I went there, it said 209. Boy, what a blessing. I love South Carolina. <laughs> 209, I thought, this is great. And all of a sudden, I went there like 20 minutes later, and it went up to 235. I walked in there, I said, uh, sign still says 209. She said, yeah, but did you not hear about the Saudi Arabia, what they did over there? And I thought, I don't care what they did over there. I went to 209. You're like, Good night. That has nothing to do with concerning me. I was so aggravated. But listen, you look around, you see all the problems and the people wanting to destroy Israel and all the struggles around us. Buddy, our Lord's coming back soon, isn't he? Listen, that means if the Lord's coming back soon, you and I got a kicker in high gear, buddy. We got to get serious about this thing about sharing the gospel. We got to say, Lord, I only have a small window of time to serve you with my life because very soon we'll come back. You know, when we go with the Lord, there'll be no more reason to share the gospel. We'll be with Him. There'll be no more reason to serve Him. We'll be with other sisters and brothers up in heaven with our Father. Only now can we use our life to serve our Savior. So why are you here? Well, God's got a specific purpose, dear friend. It's not an accident, it's not a coincidence, not by faith that you're here. It's not just because, well, let's see, let's make a little bit of money, be happy, and have a good old family and a wonderful time. That's not why we're here. God has a reason for your life. Why are you here? Well, help me, we're going to go back. Why are we here? Number one, we said, we are here to, what was it? To what? Magnify Jesus Christ. Is your life representing the life that it should represent as a Christian? Not only to magnify, we are here to, what did we say? We are here to what? Multiply. Are we sharing the gospel? Are we giving it out? Are we helping missionaries so that they can go out? Are we doing our best to get the gospel all over the world before the Lord comes back? And not only are we here to magnify and to multiply, number three, and lastly, we're here to, what was it? Minister. Your life is to be of service for the king. What are we doing? Oh, you've received this faith promise card. You know, there's all kinds of ways to give the missions. We can do it emotionally. Whenever we feel like it, let's do it. We can do it by budget. And you know what? If this fits in the budget of the church, then we'll do it. Or we can go by faith promise and say, God, by faith, I want to see you work in my life. You know, when you give the missions, the church is blessed. Because now it's going forward with God, what God taught us. You know, when you give the missions, God is blessed because his children are obeying him. Do you know when you give the missions, the lost are blessed? Because now they can hear the gospel. Do you know when you give to missions, you're blessed? Because by faith, you're saying, Father, if you can use me this year, God, to give a little bit more, God, I want to see you use my life. You know, God has a reason for you to be here. Are you serving him? Are you using your life for him? Let's go all forward. The Lord's coming back soon. Kick her in high gear, buddy. Kick her in fifth, if you say. And let's go all forward serving the Lord until he comes back. Could we pray? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, we love you. Thank you. Now, Lord, I ask that you would please do a work in our hearts. Father, Pastor Grimes has already said it, Lord. May we say, God, what do you want from me specifically? Not from my neighbor, not from my friend, not from somebody else. What do you want from me this week, God? You want my time? You want my talent? You want my dedication, my love? God, do you want my children? You want my grandchildren, God? Do you want me to go myself, God? Do you want me to help so others can go? You want me to pray? What do you want from me, God? It's a very simple sermon, Lord. Very basic. Just sharing the steps of... The reasons that you've left us here for, God. Oh, Father, may we be on fire for you, realizing that you're coming back soon. May we give our life and our love and our children, our family, our love, everything that we have. May it be all yours, God. And we'll never regret it, God. What we do for you, it's eternal in glory. Lord, I ask that you would use us. Bless Pastor as he comes and as he brings us through this time of invitation and concludes the 
the, the service as he sees fit, Lord, and may we be wise Christians to respond to you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Pastor? All right, if you want to stand to your feet tonight, please. Lisa, go ahead and begin playing something, whatever you got planned there. As you stand to your feet, all heads are bowed, all eyes are